Chair Wood, we are now live. Good evening and welcome to the Town of Ajax Heritage Advisory Committee meeting for Wednesday, May 4th, 2022. This meeting is being held electronically and live streamed on the internet. All staff and committee members are participating by phone or video. All regular practices and procedures of the committee continue to apply during this electronic meeting. If we encounter any technical difficulties, we may take a brief recess while they are resolved. Thanks for your patience. We will now proceed with the meeting. Are there any conflicts of interest from committee members with any items to be discussed this evening? Seeing none, I thank you. Now we can look for the adoption of the minutes from the previous meeting dated April 6, 2022. Do we have a motion to adopt the minutes? I'll move. Stephen does, second advice. Second for Stephen, thanks Paul. So moved. Show of hands, is everybody? And that's carried. Now we'll move to presentations and discussion items. The first thing is, is uh, the HMS Ajax River Plate Veterans Association visit. And the speaking will be Poonam Swift with Corporate and Community Festivals and the Events Coordinator. Thanks, Poonam. Thank you, Jess. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to your meeting today to discuss. Uh, so today, uh, as you mentioned, I'm going to be talking about a visit that happens, um, to my knowledge, it happens every four to five years. Um, it was supposed to happen in early 2020, but because of COVID, things got pushed back. So today I want to talk to you guys about the HMS Ajax and River Plate Veterans Association visit. Um, as you can see here, they are going to be visiting from June 18th to 25th. And this presentation today will just talk a little bit about what we've planned at the town of Ajax uh, for them and some of the exciting activities that are going to happen throughout the week. Next slide. So first and foremost, um, as I said, for the week of June 18th to the 25th, and this will actually include 11 members that have served on the 8th HMS Ajax. So we're excited to have them, um, and they'll be joined by members of their family, uh, friends. So a total about 30, 25 to 30 visitors are going to be joining us um, with, like I said, 11 of them actually being uh, members who actually served. Next slide. So for some, the events will start on Saturday, June 18th with the Mayor's Gala. So they'll have a table uh, with some of their members that are going to be joining them. For everybody else, on June 19th, we're going to be hosting an official welcome and barbecue at Town Hall uh, from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. So during that time, um, they're going to start the morning off. They have some presentations that they would like to do. Um, there's also some people that are attending that um, will be um, receiving street reserve signs. Um, so there's not necessarily a street dedication that's happening to them, but they will be still being um, presented with the plaque as they are attending. We'll kick off the day with an Indigenous welcome uh, for everybody to take part in. After the presentations, we'll be doing a tour around Town Hall. Um, after the tour, there will be a banner unveiling uh, outside at Heritage Square at Town Hall. Um, and what that is, is the Royal Canadian Legion and the town have been working together to um, kind of come up with banners as a tribute to, to these visitors. So there was some discussion about where to put the banners, but we thought it would be best um, to unveil them at Town Hall so, you know, they're more visible um, and the veterans can actually see it when they're there. After that, uh, we're going to go right into like a barbecue lunch and live music. Um, and then after a couple hours of lunch, we're actually going to open up the event to members of the public. So approximately 2.30, um, we're inviting the members of the public to come. We want them to be able to meet, uh, mingle, mix and mingle, I should say, um, and have a chance to talk with the veterans, as well as the veterans have expressed quite a bit of interest just to meet members of the public to see what Ajax is all about yet again, every time they come, they're always excited to meet new members and kind of talk to them about what we've been up to, what they've been up to, um, and learn a little bit of history from both people, from both sides. So that'll happen. And while that's happening, there's going to be um, live music playing in the back. Um, there'll be an ice cream truck on site for people to, to enjoy um, and lots of things for them, just, just some time and just very low key, but um, give them an opportunity to, to chat with one another. Next slide. 
Okay, so then throughout the week, um, as you can see here on Tuesday and Thursday, there's going to be um, street dedications. So there's going to be 10 dedications taking place over the two days. They did split it up over um, five dedications are in the north and then seven um, dedications in the south. So I just realized in my head that that's actually not 10, <laughs> uh, but there will be seven and five um, and they take place all over Ajax. And uh, during that time, they'll both run from 10 to 3 on both dates. And we did get a bus donated through um, DRT that will be taking the veterans and their families around um, and will include a stop for them to enjoy an indoor indoor lunch, uh, a lunch at an indoor venue um, for them to, to, to get through the day. Um, one thing that's not mentioned here is on the Wednesday. So when um, when we don't when I haven't talked about anything in specific, it means that they actually have their own plans. So they'll be traveling around around to different areas. Um, they might go to Toronto one day. I think they've talked about going to Thousand Islands another day. So um, in between the gaps of the dates that I haven't listed and will continue to talk about, um, they'll be doing their own thing uh, around, around Ontario. Next slide. Okay, let's move my screen here. Um, <laughs> Fast forwarding to the rest of that week, uh, we will actually end on the 25th of June, which is the Saturday. So that morning we'll start with actually a tree planting ceremony and dedication at the Indigenous Community and Healing Garden. So that'll take place in the morning and there will be an Indigenous uh, ceremony that will take place plus the um, ceremonial um, tree planting. And um, so the sugar maple tree being planted has been donated by the HMS Association and with support from the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines Charity. Um, after the tree planting ceremonies, uh, next slide, Sarah. They'll actually be heading over towards the Canadian Legion, the Royal Canadian Legion, and we'll be doing um, a parade, a ceremony, and a reception. So we'll start with the parade. Uh, the parade will begin at 12. It's a small, short parade. It's going to start at Monarch and Hunt, and it'll come... Um, it'll come eastbound down down hunt and it'll go right into the legion. So we'll do a very small parade, like I mentioned. Um, and then there'll be a ceremony at the anchor, which will include a wreath laying, a presentation to the Harwood cadets and the other ceremonial activities that they do. After the ceremony, we will head inside to the reception hall for 1.30, where we'll do a, um, a full reception for them. So it'll start with a welcome and introductions, uh, including community representatives. So um, we felt that it was really important yet again to include different groups from the community. Um, also, just to, again, explain all the great things that we've done in Ajax and how far we've come, but also learn a little bit from the veterans about where it all started. So again, just really trying to get that community feel um, and get everybody involved to, to kind of see what great things we've all been doing. Uh, we'll do some live music again, some speeches, of course, I have a fun little trivia planned, um, and then it'll include a, a sit-down three-course lunch for everybody. Then they'll mix and mingle, and around 4.30, we will wrap up. Um, and then um, that's it for the for the veterans for that day and their families. Um, and uh, as they are, some of them, most of them are leaving the next day. Uh, next slide. So that's that's really it. <laughs> it uh, there's lots happening, but when you speak it in a presentation, it seems like it goes so quickly. But um, there's definitely lots happening, and uh, we're excited to be hosting them, um, and uh, can't wait to show them around and, and all the great activities we have for them. Any questions? I guess I'd, uh, let me lead lead the charge, Kunam, and ask about the social media aspect of the visit. Are you guys going to be live streaming certain things so that people back home in England can can join in live? Or? So as of right now, we're not. Um, we, we they've kind of they haven't really expressed that interest for for that. Um, so we haven't, but we will be doing like social media throughout the week about their visit, but just nothing live streamed for back home. Okay. Very good. Mike, did I see your hand up? Yes, thank you for that presentation. Uh, that was great. Um, one of the things that we discussed at our last meeting was a historical plaque unveiling um, that we're trying to schedule. And one of the uh, options we discussed was trying to host it while the visitors were here. Um, now, I see that they already have a very busy itinerary. Is there any room for another uh, another event or are they kind of you know, packed to the gills already in terms of what's scheduled. 
So I will be honest. It seems like they're quite packed to the gills. However, having said that, I'm only planning certain aspects of this, so I don't want to speak for the entire trip. Um, Mike, what I think is best to do is if perhaps we can connect um, online with Jennifer Larman, um, as well as, uh, I'm not sure if you know community member Debbie Steer, but she's also helping to plan that. So maybe maybe first yourself, um, Jen and I can chat and we can kind of see when you, when were you thinking, like, does it matter or? Um, well, this was, this is our first opportunity actually to discuss it. It came up at the last meeting. Um, and I wasn't, uh, I wasn't sure about the date. So it was just today that I realized, you know, how soon this was actually coming up. Um, <laughs> we didn't really have any timelines. So if we could make it work during the, the visit, then that's something we wanted to pursue. If not, it's kind of open-ended for us. We can find a time that works for everybody and, and just go from there. Yeah, absolutely. One last question just about that. Um, did you guys have a specific location where you wanted the unveiling or is it just unveiling a specific plaque? Um, it's and then unveiling, later so there's an existing plaque at the West Glen property, which is um, around West Knee and Taunton. So it's very North End Ajax. Um, and that's a plaque that was installed last year, but late in the season. So we didn't have the opportunity to do a formal unveiling. Uh, okay. So this is our first chance to do it. Okay, let's connect offline um, with with Jen and the team, and then she'll be able to kind of give you more of a concrete answer if that's something that they can pull off or whatnot. Okay, yeah. thank you. No problem. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to add on to, to Mike's comment. Like, since they're already doing five street uh, uh, unveilings in the north end, and this is kind of in the north end, and you know, the next day they're doing seven in the south. Maybe we look at that as a as a as an opportunity right there, since they'll be up there and moving around. And yeah, it's just my two cents. I'm not the logistics guy, though. <laughs> I don't want to. Uh, I know that the street dedication day is all Jen, so I'm not going to speak on her behalf. Um, Anderson, that sounds like a great plan in my head as well. But uh, I'll let Jen and Michael kind of figure that uh, that piece out. But makes sense. Uh, right, can I ask a question, please, Mr. Chair? Neil, go ahead with your question. Um, what's the uh, COVID protection protocol for such a visit, I might ask? Um, are you talking about for the veterans themselves or w in what regard? Well, specifically then, because they're coming from overseas, they're uh, of a certain age. Um, is there, What's the protocols for masks and so on? So for us, our current protocols for masks are that in an outdoor event, it's completely up to staff still wear masks. So we will be wearing our masks and it's completely up to, because it's an outdoor event, um, actually indoor as well, everything has been lifted. So it's completely up to them if they would like to. We always encourage people to wear their masks, but there's we, there's nothing we can actually mandate if they don't want to, unfortunately. Um, but we will definitely keep mindful there's going to be hand sanitizers. There's still hand sanitizer stations all over inside um, Town Hall. We will have them on all of our buses that we take them on, um, as well as around the event sites. But in terms of masking and things like that, unfortunately, it's, it's more of a recommended, um, but we can't enforce anything, unless you're staff. <laughs> They've yeah. also ditched the mask in the UK like months before us, so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't put too much um, too much hope on them wearing their mask all the time. So yeah, you never know what these Brits are going to bring over. <laughs> Any other questions? In the case, we'll move on to Mike's portion of the program, starting off with uh, the heritage permit revision of 497 Kingston Road. Go ahead, Mike. Right. Thank you, Jeff. We'll just take a moment here to uh, to get the presentation loaded. All right, so this should be, I'll say should be another quick one. Um, just four items today and, uh, and most of them are, are quite quick in nature. So first one is a revision to a heritage permit update uh, that we discussed back in February relating to 497 Kingston Road West, 
which is also known as the Field Bertrand House. Uh, so just a reminder as to the, the location of this property on the south side of Kingston Road and a uh, house probably everyone will remember. So uh, the one big change that we've seen recently is to the plans for the, the front entrance door. So uh, what you see at the bottom left there is the original plans, uh, which were quite a simplistic design, but uh, still one that was sympathetic to the overall uh, Italianate style of the house. Um, the owners have actually decided to upgrade and spend a little more money, um, go with something that, <clears throat> excuse me, in my opinion, matches the style of the house a little better. Um, but given that we had already provided heritage permit approval for a specific door style, uh, it's coming back to the committee now just to ensure that everybody um, is, uh, is still in agreement with what their plans are. So last time around, I showed a couple of examples of, uh, you know, on the left, a fairly modest <clears throat> Italianate door, and then one on the right, uh, which is, you know, a little more typical um, for the style, but in that case, it was actually a wooden building. So this is a, a rendering of what's being proposed now for, uh, for the main entrance door. So the original door was going to be pine and it was going to be painted. This one is mahogany and they're going to keep the natural finish and just um, uh, stain it. So you can still tell that it's an authentic wood door. Uh, it does include a number of features that are very common to the Italianate style. So for example, the long and narrow uh, paired panels on the door, the round arch to the top of those panels, and then that central medallion motif uh, which is something that you commonly see, not just on doors, but various elements um, of, uh, of Italianate buildings. So the one area where uh, it's not exactly in keeping with typical Italianate design is the transom. So the, the window component at the top. Uh, this is much more typical of a Gothic revival um, type style door but there are reasons why the owner uh, has chosen this design and, and I'll get into those. So first off, uh, looking at the door itself, uh, I, as I've already mentioned, I think the door is a very good fit. I put a couple of examples up here. The one on the left is from Prince Edward County and you can see that sort of uh, medallion motif in the middle as well as the round arch at the top. Um, so a very different door, but a lot of uh, similar characteristics at play. The one on the right is actually a, uh, a property from the States, uh, but very, very similar to what's being proposed at this property. Um, some of the differences is the door that you see on the right is just a, a single door, whereas it's going to be paired doors, sort of split in the middle uh, at 497 Kingston Road West. And there's also glazing in the upper panels on this door. There will not be any glazing uh, on the proposed door. So it will be uh, just a solid wood door similar to what you see on the left. Now, when it comes to the transom, um, as I already mentioned, it, it really isn't in keeping with what you would expect for an Italianate style door. Um, more often than not, Italianate doors don't even have transoms. So in the upper left corner there, you'll see some um, sort of uh, you know, general uh, styles for an Italianate door. And very often they have an element of glazing near the top of the doors themselves. Um, where there are uh, transoms included, like the example on the bottom left, they tend to be quite simple. Uh, so there's one similar to the subject door there with the, the segmental arch on the bottom left. Uh, on the top right, you have an example with a, a full round arch and a sunburst design, which is somewhat similar uh, to what's in there currently. And then at the bottom right, you have an example which uh, is quite rare, but clearly lends itself with the, the rounded arches um, to the Italianate style. So that's more in keeping with what we would generally expect on an Italianate building. However, uh, on this property, there are... Uh, well, number one, there's a rear addition that has a number of Gothic elements 
uh, as you see in that central photo with the um, with the arch window there, as well as an outbuilding which also has Gothic elements. So the idea was to tie this all together through the transom. Um, I spoke with the owners uh, at length about different opportunities for the transom. And they took those ideas away and discussed it as a family and came back and said, no, we're happiest with the, the Gothic design originally proposed. Um, so that's something that, uh, that they want to move forward and are looking, for, looking to the committee for approval on that. So I think the things we have to consider today uh, are, you know, number one, is the committee willing to approve the newly proposed door? Uh, and that can be broken down into two different segments. Uh, are there any concerns about the door itself and its design? And then are there any concerns about the transom style and particularly the fact that, um, that it does demonstrate more Gothic influences than Italianate influences like the rest of the, the primary portion of the house? Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll kind of open it up to the committee uh, to, to, to see if anyone has any questions or concerns. So I guess uh, the big question for the committee is, uh, are we willing to approve the newly proposed door? Any, any talk about that? Stephen, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, the other windows at, towards the rear of the house that have the Gothic element in them, are they visible from the street or is it just from like the side of the lot or the back lot? They're generally not visible from the street. This is quite a wide lot, and some of the vegetation has actually been removed over the last couple of years. So there are areas where you probably could see that Gothic addition from the street um, if you're looking at the property from an angle. Um, as far as the outbuilding with the Gothic window, I do believe that that faces the street. So I think if you were to look right up the driveway beyond the fence, you would probably see that Gothic window up at the top. Any other questions, committee? So I guess we should, uh, is the committee willing to approve the newly proposed door? Let's put that to a vote. Um, those in favor, raise your hand. Well, I guess I can't, sorry. <laughs> it looks like the committee is in favor of the updated design. Mr. Chair, through you, if we could clarify a mover and a seconder before oh, we sorry. vote, please. Okay, can I have a, a mover on that. Someone move that. Neil's moving it, and a seconder would be Anderson. And the boat. Getting a little ahead, a little ahead of myself. I think that passes. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. So on to the next one. A uh, quick update on the Jane's Walk tour. Uh, so this tour is scheduled for uh, just a couple of days from now. It'll take place on Saturday from 10 until 11. Uh, and it's going to sort of launch from Heritage Square, uh, which is at the, the southwest corner of the uh, Town Hall campus. Uh, this is a walk that will be led by our own members, uh, Stephen and Paul. I will also be there in attendance uh, just to help out where necessary. And uh, the town, largely the town's communications department uh, has done quite a bit of work over the last little while uh, promoting this event. So we've had um, uh, it listed on websites, both the town's website and the Jane's Walk website. Uh, there have been a number of social media posts as well as uh, an advertisement in the community news section of the newspaper. Uh, if people do have friends and family that are local, I would encourage you to tell them about this event. It's a great opportunity to learn a little bit <clears throat> about the history of Ajax. Um, and I've just got sort of a few images here for people to see about the, the various promotional items that have happened. So this was uh, what's listed on the Jane's Walk website. Uh, on, through the town's website, we have a link to this poster, which shows in a little more detail uh, the stops for the walk and, and some historic photos of different elements of DIL. And then, of course, uh, all of our social media posts. And this is just an example of uh, something posted last week on Twitter. 
So in the final preparations, I just wanted to take the opportunity since, uh, you know, we have Stephen and Paul here tonight just to make sure that everything's aligning and, and they have what they need uh, for the event. So I will bring the voice amplifier on Saturday morning. I plan to arrive uh, probably around 9.30 or so. Um, I'll have the voice amplifier. I will have the reference book uh, that, that Paul will be flipping through to show visuals to people. Um, as well as participant surveys uh, with pens or pencils uh, for people to fill out after the walk. Uh, tomorrow, Stephen, I will make updates to the introductory remarks and I'll send those over to you. Thank you. Um, and then beyond that, uh, is there anything else we need to wrap up uh, in time for this weekend? I don't think so. I think, you know, we have the big, as long as you get the big flip book for Paul and uh, we're good. All right. I just, the only thing, I didn't know if you wanted to uh, try and sell some of the uh, um, picture books that we have, the the large ones. The uh, snapshots. Uh, yeah, snapshots, snapshots, of snapshots of the at the end of the day sort of thing. I didn't know if it was an idea or not. Okay, that's, that's a good idea. What I think we, is probably best is uh, I could bring along a copy of the book and have people see it if they're interested. And then we'd likely have to have them come back uh, to Town Hall when it's open, so okay. the following week, to okay. make the purchase there. Sure. But I think that's a great idea because okay. if people have an interest in this subject matter, then I imagine they'll have an interest in, in the book, which has quite a lot of resources relating to DIL. Through you, Mr. Chair, is it possible, Mike, that we might be able to get a copy to do a draw giveaway for the participants? I'm pretty sure between you and I, we might be able to get our hands on a copy. Wrangle one up. <laughs> I'll see what I can do tomorrow. Also on that note, do we have any promo materials? I'm, I'm not sure if they were left with Brenda or yourself, but if any keychains or pens, if that's something that you might want to give to participants or. I found some pens today, which I was planning on bringing for the, uh, for the survey. So we can let people keep those pens if they fill out a survey. Um, beyond that, I don't think I have too much in terms of other sort of giveaway items. Okay. Well, I will take it as my task to look into getting a, a giveaway book. All right. Um, once again, thinking of the social media aspect of, of this walk, um, <clears throat> I imagine the town's communications department will be uh, covering it quite well. But if any of our members choose to snap 10 or 15 seconds of video on their iPhones of the various stops along the way, we could um, show our flag, if you will, online. So um, if anybody's willing to do that, just it takes maybe 15 seconds each stop and uh, then I'll, I'll get it from you afterwards seeing as I won't be able to attend. Just an idea. All right, I'm happy to take a few videos if, uh, that, would if that would be useful. Very useful. That way if we can use the town's product and ours. All right, perfect. Beautiful. All right, thank you everyone. On to the next one. So just a quick update on the uh, Canada, Canada or Canadian History X script revisions. Um, so this was something I sent out to the, the committee probably a couple of weeks ago now for a review, um, but I don't think we did sort of a formal introduction to the, the project the, the time it was introduced. So I wanted to provide just a little more uh, background about exactly what these podcasts are. Um, so this is an initiative that's led by a gentleman named Craig uh, Beard, and he's a journalist from Western Canada that's actually uh, worked in, I think, BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, if I'm not mistaken, and currently writes uh, newspaper columns on the history of towns and that sort of thing. So a gentleman that has a lot of experience in this field, um, he put out an offer to what I'm assuming is most municipalities in Canada uh, to produce these 10 to 15 minute podcasts on the history of their town. And uh, this was, as I said, coast to coast, uh, trying to you know cover as much of Canada as possible. And at the point when he started advertising this, he had already done about 40 of these community history podcasts, and those are all available on his website. Uh, he's seemed to kind of carve out a, a nice little niche for himself uh, with over 15,000 downloads a week, in some cases, of his materials. 
Um, and the, uh, the real selling point, I think for us, the first time I brought it up was uh, this very low cost, $250 to get involved. And that would include all of the research, all of the writing and all of the recording. So if you have an opportunity um, after this meeting to check out his website, I recommend you do. Uh, this is just a page from the website showing that uh, many of the entries are in fact small town entries, but there are also various other historical items uh, that he does cover with his podcasts. So the script was received in April and then uh, circulated to, uh, to Heritage Committee members for comment. Um, I'll be the first one to admit it wasn't exactly what I was expecting uh, when we went into this. I was expecting more of a comprehensive history of the town. And what we got was something a little bit different. But I've come to think it's, it's probably... Uh, a better tool for us because we already have a lot of information out there about our history uh, as a whole. We have some great textbooks available. We have the snapshots book, um, a ton of information available online. Uh, what we got with this podcast script was some of the highlights of our history, but then a little more details on some unique little components. Uh, in some cases, things that I wasn't even aware of. Um, and in one case, uh, very in-depth information about a NHL hockey player from Ajax. Um, so a lot of the comments that I received back from committee members was about, you know, perhaps reducing some of the content on the hockey player, focusing more on things like DIL. And while I agree, agree that that really forms the most important component of our history, at the same time, I am hesitant to push too hard um, because this is a product that, that Craig has, uh, you know, very clearly been working on for a while. And he, as I said, he's sort of carved out a niche for himself in terms of what people would expect um, and what his audience is looking for. So I think he would have quite a good sense of that. And I assume the material he picked was for a good reason. So what I'll be doing is I'll be providing feedback to him uh, in some cases, there were things that were inaccurate. There were uh, dates that might be a little misleading, or there were situations where perhaps some uh, important information was, was left out. So in those cases, I've recommended that that actually be added into the script. In other cases, uh, I've posed it as recommendations. So uh, for example, I know Pam uh, had some really good comments she provided about sort of beefing up the section on DIL. And what I've done is I've added an extra line or two that uh, to say, you know, we really would like at least this information. But if you want to take that a little further, uh, here are some other items uh, that you can look into. So I, I think that's a fair way to approach it. Uh, it will add some of the information that we really feel is important and should be in there. At the same time, it still allows Craig to kind of, you know, have creative control over this and uh, and position, position the information that he's come across. So any comments on that? Nope. All right. Move right along then to the last item. And it is the, uh, the West Glen plaque unveiling, which we've already somewhat discussed tonight. So um, this was raised, I guess, at last month's meeting when I wasn't in attendance. And, and I thank everyone that provided uh, some comments and, and feedback. Uh, that gave me a sense of, uh, I think, what everybody's looking for. And it sounded like overwhelmingly people are in favor of holding a, uh, a public event for this unveiling, especially given the fact that we're coming out of COVID and we haven't had the opportunity to do many things like this over the last couple of years. So I will work with uh, the staff team, as discussed earlier, to determine if there is an opportunity um, to host it during the visits uh, from the veterans. And Anderson, that was a fantastic suggestion. Uh, you're right, they already will be in the area. Uh, perhaps there's a way to make that uh, work during the, uh, the street naming ceremonies in Northern Ajax. So that'll be my goal to kind of uh, slip it in to, to that day. If we're unsuccessful with that, um, we have lots of other opportunities. 
So we can, um, you know, we can reconvene and determine when a good time is uh, for us to hold this event. Um, I was doing a little bit of thinking about, uh, you know, speakers we could have when we did our last plaque unveiling. Um, we had a local chiropractor come out and say a few words. And, and I think that was quite nice to get a, an outside perspective on, on the matter. So in this case, given this is uh, West Glen property, which was in the, uh, the family, the Westney family for a number of years up until very recently, uh, I think there is and there would be an opportunity for us to reach out to members of the Westney family and see if they wanted to come out and attend and say a few words and, and you know, share their unique perspective on uh, this property and what it means to them. In terms of logistical issues, uh, I think we will have to have a few conversations uh, about how we want to promote this event. Uh, typically, as you know, we, we just put the information out there, say that it's a public event and, you know, allow whoever's interested to attend. There are a few, uh, a few obstacles that could make that a little more difficult in this case. Um, for example, uh, there's not much in the way of parking. Uh, people can access this site sort of through the, the back local roads, but there's, there's nothing along Westney. Um, I think we also have to be mindful uh, about people's properties. There are residential properties uh, all around this site. So while it is a public site and we do have the right to gather there, um, one of the things I was discussed at the last meeting was inviting the locals and having that maybe as the primary base of people in attendance for this event. So that's something we'll have to consider as well. Uh, construction, as I mentioned previously, there is a large uh, road widening project happening currently along Westney. I imagine if we settle the details on this event quite soon, we will be able to reach out to the region and try to uh, negotiate maybe an hour of, of silence or, or no activity uh, in the immediate locations around this site uh, so that you know we're not too disturbed by that during the event. And then the other thing I think um, we should discuss discuss is the whether or not we want to have some sort of small reception. So planning does have a small, budget for events like this. I believe it's $300 that we could put towards refreshments and that sort of thing. Uh, I imagine we could set it up right at the site with a small table, um, or perhaps, you know, we, we could go back to another town venue if, if that seems reasonable as well and hold a reception there. So just a few ideas I've been thinking through. Uh, I will open it up to the committee uh, for any discussion or any advice that people may be able to provide. Uh, perhaps I can lead with that, Mike, Michael, and say that uh, there's an eagerness for the committee to do something in public again. I think there's a longing for it. And if it could be rolled into the greater celebration of the Ajax veterans, that would be very fortunate. But uh, I think uh, there's, a, there's a very basic need for us to get out in front of people again, and this would be a great, a great chance to do it. Any other comments? None that I see. So the next thing on our agenda is the Heritage Video Project update. And uh, Sarah was gonna roll our latest effort on Jackson Point. And it's probably the most tranquil one that we've shot. So try and stay awake. <laughs> Only two minutes. I'll leave it in your hands, Sarah. Standing by. This is an Ajax Heritage Minute. Today we are at Simcoe Point, part of the town's extensive public waterfront, the largest in the GTA. The first European settler here was William Peake, who built a log cabin close to the mouth of Duffin Street in 1995. He trapped and traded furs, built an early mill, and maintained good relations with First Nations peoples, in particular Chief Wakakishko. Life was good here, with plentiful salmon in the creek and a dense forest teeming with game, William Peake and his wife Margaret raised a family of 12 children. Peake descendants remained on the point for generations, living on this land for more than a century. William Peake's great-granddaughter, Mary Ann, 
married John Greenlaw, and together they built Simcoe House, a thriving summer resort. The business stayed in the family until 1911 when John Greenlaw died and it was destroyed by fire in the 1950s. Charred remains can still be found if you look carefully. Simcoe Point is also the final resting place for many of the Peake Greenlaw family. And it is believed that William and Margaret Peake are buried here as well. Full burial records have been lost with time as have the grave markers. But we do know that burials extend beyond the fenced area. A plaque commemorates known burials, including three sailors whose bodies washed ashore at the turn of the century. It's a unique place and at times a bit spooky. Much older than Ajax, it's a link to an earlier time when families and ancestors were all together on the same piece of land from birth until passing. Check out this quiet spot on your next trip to Rotary Park. You'll see traces of the Peak family's 100 years of living on the point. And there you go, that's our latest effort. And uh, thanks for your patience. Thanks, Mike, for your appreciation. Um, um, in terms of our next project, um, Pam was sure would probably back this up. We were thinking of doing DIL, but a little, take, we're trying to sort of take the mickey on the um, fact that Scarborough may have made more munitions than, than uh, the Dill plant in Ajax. So we, we'd like to sort of throw that out there in a lighthearted manner, talk to some people in Scarborough, Hey, do you think you made more than Ajax? And they'll say, "What's a, what's an Ajax?" Something like that. So the next the next one will be probably sort of trying to take take a little bit of a ribbing to, to Scarborough. So that's that's uh, the last project and what's coming up. And uh, does anybody have any questions, comments? Mr. Sajak, I just wanted to say. Uh, I figured this one didn't feature any buildings, so it would be my least favorite. I, I think it is my favorite. It's. I think that you guys are really coming into your own in terms of setting up the story and then with the, the video elements as well. Um, like it was an incredibly entertaining video. And uh, when I watched it for the first time, I, I would have guessed it was only 20 seconds because it was just, it passed so quickly. And then I saw it was two, two minutes. Um, really, really impressed with this video, and I think you guys did a fantastic job. Good. Well, thanks to uh, Pam, who's not here right now, but uh, everybody else who was involved, it was a, a committee group decision, and sometimes it's hard to get things done when there's a lot of people providing input, but this is this was a very easy group of people to work with. So thanks very much. Uh, the next thing on our list is correspondence. Nothing to reveal. Very good. And the next thing is the update from Council. Councillor Khan, do you have anything to share with the committee at this time? Of course. I can't wait for my moment. Good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to um, let you know that we did do the ceremonial groundbreaking on the Grandview. Uh, the Grandview Kids and the Grandview Kids Foundation. Um, it's going to be located uh, around Taunton and Harwood, just, just north Harwood, around by the back of the Montessori School, around that area. Um, this new headquarters will support family-centered care for children and youth with physical communication and developmental needs, feature an integrated mix of specialized rehabilitation, medical and clinical services, education and research activities. Uh, learn more, ajaxgrandview.ca or grandviewkids.ca as well. Um, very big deal. Um, it's going to bring a lot of jobs and a, a lot of care and traffic more to Ajax, I would say. Um, that was done on April 23rd, the last, the last week, pretty much in, in April. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, Monday, uh, May 2nd, we, we raised the Armenian flag. Uh, we, we, you know, we have, we've been studying and the residents have been reaching out. Uh, there, was, there was a massive Armenian genocide and um, we got them to bring a delegation to council and um, we were able to offer them that day, Monday at 11 o'clock, and we hoisted their flag very emotional. Uh, people had photos of their 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 family, their grandparents who who were killed, who were killed in, in the genocide. And um, related to that, uh, May is also Jewish Heritage Month, and we will be acknowledging the Jews and their trauma with the Holocaust. 
uh, there will be um, celebrate, well, not celebrations, but memorials at the town hall. We'll, we'll know more about it. I'm sure it's all going to be on the website. And um, the Jewish community is going to bring a uh, delegation to council at our council meeting later on in this month. So um, thank you very much. That's my update. Um, if I may, Councillor, has the uh, council been active in any of the relief efforts for Ukraine? Um, are there any families that want to move here? Or is that totally a federal thing? You guys? No, no, we, uh, we have uh, several families coming into to Ajax. Um, so yeah, we have been very welcoming and, um, you know, the staff has been accommodating all, all that. And um, I think we should be proud as a town for, for being part of, of, of this move. Yeah, we, we so, are. So Ajax is very much part of this effort and out front and... A hundred percent. Yes, sir. Good, good, good. Glad to know. All right. Good. Any other questions of the councillor? So now we move on to other business. Does anyone have any other business to share? I have, just have one note, Even? Michael. Um, have, were you in that house, uh, 527 Kingston Road, the one that they wanted to rip down and put the apartments in there, in the back? Sorry, what was the question? Uh, were, have you ever been in that building on Kingston Road? I haven't been in it, but the uh, heritage impact assessment we received had uh, numerous photos of the interior. Okay. I was in there on Saturday. Oh, were you? Okay. Want to get in it, you'll be able to get in and have a look around. But you can tell you can tell that the the, um, the actual inside of the house portion because of the thickness of the walls. It's more like um, the walls are like Daryl's house were. Right. And then you see where the additions were put on and, and the side room sort of thing. So it was quite interesting. The house is still for sale, though, or yeah, the property's for sale. You must have dissuaded the uh, gentleman from putting in the buildings he wanted. So that I didn't realize that one was actively for sale right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, the liberal candidate for the next election has that as their... Um, office okay all right i wasn't aware of that either okay and i had one other the house stupid phone <laughs> the building at the um south east corner of kingston road and church the one that's the apartment or they were townhouses or whatever What's happening with it? It seems to be just, they put in the concrete and then it's been sitting there for like six months. Right. So I don't know how much of the detail I can get into on that one, but uh, the town's been working with them uh, just to ensure they have the permits required to do the work. Um, so all of it has been approved Um from the planning perspective, like they had their site plan agreement and that sort of thing, there were a number of requirements that they needed to meet in terms of doing uh, environmental remediation and getting the proper permits from the town. So I think that paused for a short time um, to ensure that they did have all that stuff that they needed. Okay. But I think the expectation is once all that's cleared up, uh, they'll get right back to work. Well, it's good good to know. It's just that um, with all the new stuff that the uh, the conservatives have put in there to, to tie everybody's hands and uh, give the builders the, the right of way to do what they want, basically, there seems to be no consequence for the builders. If they have a chunk of property and they put in a permit and then they sit on the property for two or three years, but you only have 60 days to put the give them the okay to build it doesn't seem right just my two cents it's political it, well, it's Go ahead, political, but it's it's part of part of its heritage too so <laughs> michael is there anything new on 775 kingston east that's the building next to uh, mcmillan orchards no, nothing, uh, nothing new at this point. Um, I need to to work with bylaw again to eventually uh, 
sort of implement the original uh, property standard stuff that we were looking at that kind of um, prompted all of the designation uh, or prompted the designation to begin with. Um, it hasn't been sort of high priority uh, in terms of my workload, but uh, that really does need some follow up. So I will uh, I'll report back to the committee at the next meeting on that one. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, before we adjourn, I'd like to thank you all personally for taking time to come to this meeting. Um, staff, councillor, members, um, it's a part of the democratic process, which is very important. And we will only have one more meeting coming up, and then I think we'll be down for a bit until the new council is formed. So hopefully we'll see you at the next meeting, but if we don't, thank you much for very much for your participation. Go ahead, Neil. Um, before you adjourn, I have to ask, uh, this is to, to Sarah, we're talking about another electronic meeting here, and I'm asking why, given that the town has opened up just about everything, why are we still meeting remotely? Why can't we get together for one last meeting? Or, you know, we could uh, be several feet apart in the meeting room. What's uh, the uh, current situation there, Sarah? Through the chair, thank you for the question, Neil. It is a, de a decision that's been made by council and staff to continue in a virtual format for the time being. Part of that has to deal with that there are substantive renovations that would be taking place in council chambers regarding the audio and visual components to allow for a hybrid both virtual and in-person meeting environment coming into place as of September, we're hoping. So that puts a shift on availability of meeting spaces right now okay. in terms of continuing support for a live stream because we've currently been able to live stream our meetings in a virtual space. In the space that we would have available for an in-person meeting, we wouldn't necessarily have the same capability at this current time with the equipment that's in place. That's one of the reasons, but that's not to say that before the end of the term, yes, our meetings are continuing electronically. We always look to have some type of social opportunity to wrap up the end of our term. So I will be in touch with all of our committee members over the next coming weeks to share some more information on those opportunities. Okay, thanks for the explanation. Thanks for the question. So I guess we look forward to a physical meeting in the flesh probably soon, sooner than we think. It's a bit of a bouncing ball in terms of uh, COVID, but uh, cross our fingers. And once again, thank you very much for your participation. Um, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Jeff, um, you, can't, you can't make that a motion. We have to make it for you. Okay. <laughs> Go on then, Stephen, make it. I'd like to move that we adjourn this meeting. Second. Seconder? <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> Our next meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, June 1st, 2022. And at this time is scheduled as an electronic meeting. We'll see. <laughs> Thank you very much.